And the scripture says, this is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Mm. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Oh God. He didn't say put on the shining armor of Jesus Christ. Mm. It said put on the shining armor of right, right living. living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Yes. Don't participate in darkness, in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. I'm mm. going to read that part again. Because our tendency is to pick two or three out of every vice list, mm. make them the bad guys and leave everybody else to go free. Mm. But the Bible says, don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. In other words, even if you're not sleeping with the wrong person, but you're jealous of your neighbor, you still ain't right. Right. Mm. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think, do not let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. I need to do that 13 and 14 again. Because we belong to the dead, we must live decent lives for all to see. Right. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. I want to preach this morning from the topic, it's getting too late. Mm. It's getting too late. Late. Hallelujah. You can have your seats. Thank you, Lord. Have you ever been hanging out with some friends? Maybe on a Friday or a Saturday or even a Sunday or a Tuesday evening. And suddenly somebody says, It's 10 o'clock. Maybe it's a weekday, you're home dilly-dallying, doing this, that, or the other, and you take notice of the clock and realize that it's gotten late. Often when that happens, people begin to spring into action because we realize that our window of opportunity is becoming more and more narrow. I thought I was going to get the laundry done tonight. I thought I was going to pay the bills. I thought I was going to run the vacuum, but it's already 9.30. So now my mind switches from all of the things that I wanted to do to the things that I must do. Anybody, am, am I talking to anybody? Am I talking? Well, at least if I got something that I can shake out and wear to work tomorrow, I'm all right. I'm talking about it's getting too late. As time progresses, our perspective about opportunity begins to shift. And we come under an urgent need to put the main thing first and put our priorities in order. 
is getting too late. Time passing is a sobering reality. Lord have mercy. It is a sobering reality. I was out Friday until after 10 o'clock. on a Friday. I can barely handle it on a Saturday. But but 20 years ago, Amen. I could be on my way out at 10 o'clock. You, you understand what I'm saying? Amen. We're ha not haven't even decided what we're getting ready to do. But with the passage of time, right. stuff starts shifting. And now I realize that if I want to do something, if I want to enjoy something, I got to do it earlier because soon it will be getting too late. Time is a sobering reality. And I want you all to know today, in case you didn't know, that we live in a sobering hour. It is getting too late. The Apostle Paul says it here, Romans the 13th chapter, that in light of the lateness of the hour, our most urgent obligation is to love. He speaks of this obligation to love as if it were a debt. In fact, he says, owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. In other words, as a believer in Christ Jesus, everyone that I come in contact with has a right to my love. I don't have to like them. I don't have to agree with them. They don't have to like me. They don't have to agree with me. But he says, oh, no one anything except for your obligation to love one another. They don't have to worship like I worship. They don't have to think like I think. But as a believer in Christ Jesus, everyone that I have I come in contact with has the right to my love. Somebody say amen. But we cannot let, listen to this, this is important, love, nor our love of love, some people love love, we cannot let love or our love of love divorce us from our love of truth. You need to let that settle. We cannot let love or our love of love divorce us from our love of truth. In other words, no matter how much I love you, Brother Ray Scott, no matter how much I will go to the ends of the earth for you to demonstrate my love for you, to sacrifice for you, if you are coming against the truth of God, I cannot undermine truth in order to uphold love. This is important. Because Paul is using in this passage of scripture the word late in an eschatological sense, in the sense of dealing with the last things. He is reminding us of the fact that the day will come when God is going to roll up the whole earth like a napkin. He's going to shake out all the crumbs and everything that is not attached to him by way of Jesus Christ will be separated from him forever. And then what remains, he's going to swish around in the blood of Christ, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world and unroll a whole new heaven and a whole new earth. But in the meantime, it's getting late. Paul is talking about late with respect to the return of Christ Jesus. And I want to remind us that we are not living in this earth forever. In fact, as the saints used to say, this earth is not our home. But we are not only, and not only is it getting late in terms of the return of Christ, it is also getting late in terms in your and my personal history. For the word of God declares that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Even if you never heard it in scripture, you know folks die. It's getting late. Not only is it getting late in terms of the return of Christ and in terms of our own personal history and time on the earth, but it is also, and this is, and this is critically important for us to understand today, it is also getting late in terms, listen to this, of our ability to sense the prompting of God. Who are you talking about, overseer? 
What are you talking about? That it's getting late in terms of our ability to sense the prompting of God. You do understand that the time will come when we have so resisted the conviction of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit will fail to convict us anymore. Yeah. It's getting late. It's getting late. It's getting late. In fact, it's getting too late for some of the things that we have made ourselves comfortable with. With some of the things that we have gone from just allowing to entertaining to participating in to celebrating, it is getting late. And one of the things that needs to happen as a result of it getting late is we need to begin to distinguish between what will be nice and what is essential. Somebody say amen. amen. I want you to look at this scripture because this passage of scripture makes an important distinction for us. One that I'm sorry to say is lacking in the world, but in the body of, and also in the body of Christ. It's not surprising that it's lacking in the world. It's troublesome that it's lacking in the body of Christ. Look at what he says in the scripture. Notice that he says, do not participate in the works of darkness. You see that in the scripture? Do not participate. Do not participate. I want you not only to notice what he says, but I want you to notice what he does not say. He does not say, do not desire. Mm -hmm. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity or moral living or quarreling and jealousy. He says, don't participate. He does not say, don't desire. In fact, in a later part of the scripture, he assumes that even for the genuine believer, there will be the presence of ungodly desire. And do not let yourself think about ways to gratify the evil desires of your flesh. You see it? Yeah. He's talking to believers and he says to the believers, don't participate in darkness. And he ends the section saying, do not let yourself think about how to indulge the evil desires of your flesh. I need us to understand this distinction because there is so much in our lives as believers and in our witness in the world that depends on this distinction. The distinction between desire and participation. We need to get this because it's getting late. He doesn't say don't desire. He says, don't participate. Understand this, the world, your cousins in them, the people in your job, the people who do not know Christ Jesus and who are still living their lives according to the kingdom of men, the kingdom of this earth. The world does not make a distinction between desire and participate. The world says, if you desire it, you might as well go on and do it. Come on, let's tell the truth. How many of us in here the devil ever got with that? <laughs> If you desire it, if that's your inclination, you might as well just go on. It's just as bad. You just think about it anyway. You want to anyway. So you just might just go on. Take that job. That's the perspective of the world. The world that does not make a distinction between desire and participate and in fact tells us that if we have a desire that we are not participating in, we're doing harm to ourselves. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. Something is wrong. You can be so much happier, which by the way means healthier. If you would just participate in the thing that you desire. Y'all with me? But I need you to understand that for God, the issue is not desire. The issue in the mind of God is participation. I need somebody to hear me today. Yes. Salvation is not based on, sal on desire. Salvation is based on participation. Judgment will not be based on desire. Judgment will be based on participation. The issue with God is not whether we desire to do evil, but whether we participate in the evil that we desire. As a saved, sanctified, I look holy today, right? Amen. It's Advent. I do those things. Sanctified, Holy Ghost filled believer. How many of us know? I'll tell you about myself if you don't want to tell about yours. I desire a lot of things that I should not. Y'all just going to make me look. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Desire a lot of things that I really should not. I desire things that I read in the scripture. I ain't got no business desiring. I desire things that I heard a message preach. I desire things that I preach the message. That let me know that I have no business desiring. And that's being saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Desiring things that I truly should not. The Bible says that we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. In other words, I came here with contrary and perverse desires already built in. I'm set up this way. And coming into Christ does not purge us of all contrary desires. Now, does he work on things? Yes. Does he sanctify? Yes. Does he cleanse? Yes. Does he renew our minds? Yes. Does he restore our souls? Yes. But how many know that after he finishes doing all that and you get up off the altar good and soggy, by the time you hit the parking lot, you still have a desire that is not pleasing to God? The scripture says that we have been born in sin. Paul said, and shaped in iniquity. We started out with contrary desires. The apostle Paul who wrote over two thirds of the New Testament, even he said, when I want to do what is right, when I want to do what I know pleases God, when I want to do what is honorable and what is decent and respectable and what is holy, I find in myself another set of desires. Can I help somebody? We are all, look at somebody and say that means me. We are all, look at somebody else and say that means me. We are all naughty by nature. Everybody, somebody say everybody. 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 The bishop, the archbishop, the metropolitan, the potentate. All. Er, everybody. The ones with collars, the ones without collars. Er, everybody. And so sometimes people look at us and oh, you, you, you know, you're a pastor. You don't understand that being a pastor does not mean that I'm not naughty by nature. Being a pastor means I'm just extra grateful for all of the ways he has covered. Yes. Covered me. Lord have mercy. So I can stand in this place and dare to speak for him. We are all wrestling with ungodly desires. But what is it, Minister Patrick, that determines, let me hold that, that Bible, my participation in my desire? Thank you. As a believer, now I'm talking about believers. As a believer, I have the obligation to fact check my desires. Yes. 
So when my flesh is screaming, my job is to say, hold on flesh, give me a minute. Oh, no, we're not going to be able to do that today. We're not, we're not, we're not going to be, we not, I, I done fact checked it and as it turns out, you a lie. Come on, how many know that desire can be a liar? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, yeah. As a believer, it does not give me a pass on ungodly desires. Let me tell you something, saved men that love their husbands have a desire, they love their wives, Lord Jesus. <laughs> so, they have a desire, that love with the desire to find satisfaction elsewhere. Lord Jesus. It's not that they're not saved. They're just still men. Saved women that want to be so holy and sanctified. Come on, let's not just talk about sexual immorality because it talks about quarreling. Because some of y'all ain't sleeping with nobody but arguing with everybody. kind of language in our in our day, right? Here it is. In the kingdom of men, we, they, repurpose God, y'all ready? You taking notes? In order to accommodate their desire. In the kingdom of men. If this is what I desire, and I really, really desire it, and I really, 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 really desire it, like really, really desire it, and I can't talk myself out of desiring it, if the Bible says that this is sin, then I have to now change my perspective and perception of the Bible. Well, the Bible doesn't really say. Mm. Well, I mean, who wrote it? Mm. So, 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 that the same Bible that you would use to, to, to claim your healing and your deliverance and your financial breakthrough is now suspect because it's challenging you on your desire to participate. Not just on your desire, but participation. Right. So, it was good when we were praying for your grandma. Let me just be clear. Right. It was good I mean, how do we really know? What does the Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic say? Would, would it help you if you knew? You, you speak Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic? You understand? In the kingdom of the world, the practice is to repurpose God in order to accommodate desire. Somebody say, but we belong to another kingdom. kingdom of God where evil desire is not yet fully banished we operate by a different rule of life while the world is repurposing God in order to accommodate desire in the kingdom of God we repurpose desire in order to accommodate God That's my job as a believer. That's my responsibility as one who names the name of Christ Jesus. Can I prove it to you? Can I prove it to you? Because y'all like, uh, I don't know, really. Mm. Romans chapter 1. Look at what the scripture says. Yes, they knew God. But they would not worship him as God. Lord have mercy. 
nor would they give him thanks. And they began to think up, listen, foolish ideas of what God was like. They, they began to think up a God that was more manageable and more suitable and more accommodating to their desires. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. When your standard of truth keeps shifting, it's very, it won't be very long before you are in a place of continual darkness and confusion. The scripture says, claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. In other words, they created something more suitable for themselves to worship. They would not take God on his own terms. They decided that they were going to make God a little bit. I don't want to reject him. I just want to tweak him. I don't want to abandon him. I just want to tweak him. Claiming the, to be, uh, the, the scripture says, instead of worshiping the glorious ever living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people. Look at what happens in verse 24. So God did what? Abandoned them to do whatever things their hearts desired. What does that mean? What does that mean? As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself. Listen, if we don't have time to get in the word of God and we don't have time to get in prayer because we're too busy scrolling and we're too busy online shopping and we're too busy with our friends and we're too busy with our, our families, we have have, we have perverted desire. Lord Jesus. Listen, it says that is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. What does it mean? That there was a time when they had ungodly desires and God. Y'all not hearing me. There was a time when they had ungodly desires and God. Do you understand that you can have ungodly desires and God? Can I talk to somebody who the devil keep trying to tell you you're not saved? You can have ungodly desires and God. But because they continue to try to squeeze God into a format that would allow them to participate in the things that they desire, God said, I'm going to dip because clearly you prefer that than to me. He abandoned them to their desires. The truth of the matter is that when we keep rejecting God's truth, we will come to a place where he will abandon us to our desires. If you think it's bad now, with the grace of God, with the presence of God, with the strength of the Holy Ghost, with the help of the Spirit of God, can you imagine what your life would be like if God abandoned you to your desires? Lord have mercy. It's getting too late, y'all. What is it getting too late for? Well, first of all, it's getting too late for wishy-washy. That's an old lady word. Wishy-washy definitions of Christian. It's getting too late for wishy-washy definitions of Christian. It's getting to me. The call is to follow Christ. That means that if my desire will lead me in a place that is away from him, that if my, de or when my desire and his truth come into conflict with one another, I abandon my willingness to participate in order to honor my obligation to follow. Y'all with me? When my Christ and my desire are both vying for my affections, I choose my Christ over my desire every time. It's getting too late to be naming the name of Christ Jesus but worshiping at the altar of desire. 
It's getting too late to be calling ourselves Christians, to be calling ourselves believers, but when we look at you, you have no cross and you are not following Christ. Isn't that what Jesus said? Take up your cross and follow me. What is the cross for? The cross is for the purpose of killing the flesh. He said, take up your cross and follow me. It is too late to simply consider ourselves believers because we pray the prayer, but there is no fruit in our lives. It's too late to consider ourselves believers because we believe in Christ Jesus, but our lives have not in any way been impacted and transformed by the reality and the truth that he provides. It's getting too late. I want to say, even to our youth, and to, to not just our youth, but also to our youth, that God is not only expecting those of us who are over a certain age to begin to live our lives for him. He is expecting you to live your life for him. He is expecting you not just to come to church or not just to come to Bible study and to start a reading plan when you feel distressed about something, but he wants intimate relationship and connection and fellowship with you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to talk with you. He wants to reassure you that you belong to him. Yes, yes, yes. It's getting too late to be satisfied with being nominal Christians. Jesus. Then if you didn't say I'm Christian, people wouldn't even ever guess. I love it when I'm talking to somebody. So I'm like, I know you're a Christian. And I'm talking to you. You're a Christian? What? Mm. It's a good indication that something is missing. Not only is it getting too late for wishy-washy definitions of Christian, but it's getting too late, listen, it's getting too late to, for trying it and see what happens. It's getting too late to try it and see what happens. That's the language of the adversary. Just try it. They ain't gonna kill you. Just, just say we'll bite. I mean, it's fruit. Just, just try. ain't nobody gonna know. No, nobody from church even hang out in this side of town. Just try it. Just try it. I mean, how bad could it really? really? Can, can I tell you something? I went to, I think I might have shared this before, I went to a, a healing, uh, a healing clinic, like the Ministry of Healing. Well, I believe it's at Washington Crossing Church. They have a healing, it was set up like a con like counseling room. You go in there and they get you healed. That's what they do. That's what they do. It's all right, without sweating. I don't even think they're speaking in tongues. He says, Father, we pray, you know, real easy and calm. <laughs> and the man prayed for me. And when he finished praying, while he was praying, he was saying, I rebuke the spirit of alcoholism. I was like, oh, snap, that's it, Jesus. Rebuke it then. But you know, my flesh, I was a little like, offended? Is that what I'm drink? Like, not even, I know something, we could drink wine, you could drink wine. Not with my family history. I, do you understand? These are games I can't play. <laughs> I got to check myself when I'm going too hard on a sparkly cider, you know what I'm saying? Because I like that little wine glass and a little, you know, little, I'm all right, catch you. <laughs> but look, so I don't drink. Have I ever drank in life? I drank, and it was horrible. It was a bad idea. It was a bad combination. It was just enough for me to be like, God, I, I don't want to do this. But watch this. So years and years and years, I never drank. I was in a hotel room one day, and I was drifting off to sleep, and the taste of bourbon came in my mouth. How do I know what bourbon tastes like if I never drank? I don't know, but that's what it was. It was definitely alcohol. I woke up praying and binding and rebuking the devil. Years later, my point is, it's too late for try it and see. Years later, I'm in this healing clinic about something else. The man is praying for me and starts rebuking the spirit of alcoholism. And I had to rebuke myself from getting offended while he was rebuking. You understand what I'm saying? But when he finished, he said to me, he said, when I'm praying for people's healing, if there's something unclean, I get a headache. I get this headache. He said, and as I was praying for you, I got, a, got that headache and I asked the Lord what it was. And he said, it's the spirit of alcoholism that's in your bloodline. Mm, wow. 
Do you understand that try it and see could have ruined my whole life? It's too late. It's too late. It's too late. It's too late. Listen, some of y'all, you can't try stuff that your brother can try. You can't try stuff that your best friend from high school can try. It's getting too late for trying it and see. Listen, some of us are in a place of desperation and some of us are in a place of pain and you have begun considering in this last six months things that you never considered before. You've been thinking about trying some stuff just to see. I'm telling you today in Jesus' name, it is getting too late for trying it and see. Not only is it getting too late for trying and see, it's getting too late to be indulging in harm and hoping that it doesn't catch up to you. My Lord. Because some of us are past tried and see. And we've entered, entered into done it and paranoid. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You know what it's like when you playing in waters, you ain't got no business playing in? You wonder if everything's like, it's too late for try it and hope that it doesn't catch up to you. So we just finished celebrating Thanksgiving. I've been eating still. Hallelujah. My civics told the story today. I've been eating still. Ain't no stretch. <laughs> Half that pot. Stop playing. For real. We just spend time with family members and everybody, most of us, especially as people of color, you got that aunt, that uncle, that parent that is not supposed to have. Yes. They're not supposed to have him. You, you understand? I understand that for the first 40 years of your life, you ate ham for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. I understand that you live for ham, but the doctor has now said, your blood pressure is dangerously high, you need to get off the ham. Y'all got people like this? Maybe, maybe it's sugar. I'm, I'm not coming for sugar today. I'm gonna do salt, because sugar is my thing, and I don't, you know what I'm saying? Talk about ham! I had ham in 12 years. Let's talk about ham! What happens? Listen, just because the doctor has said ham will harm you does not remove their desire for ham. Amen. In fact, in some cases, they want ham even more. Because they say, if I knew that my last ham was my last ham, huh? If I knew it was my last ham, I would have hammed up the ham a little bit more. You understand what I'm saying? I would got that end part, that run. You know, you know what I mean? If I knew that my last ham was my last ham. And so you sit at Thanksgiving and everybody know Aunt Susie ain't supposed to be eating ham. Aunt Susie, what you do? I'm just going to get a little. Just, just going to get a little. See, but your history is that you can't handle a little piece. You, And see. And this is not the moment 
to indulge and this is my favorite. I'm going, I'm going to double up on my medicine. So now you are going to do intentional harm and on the back end, try to do a double correction with the hope that you can undo the harm that has already been. Do y'all understand what I'm talking about? This is not the time to indulge in harm and hope that it doesn't catch up to you because there really does come a time when God will turn you over to experience and feel the consequences, Lord Jesus, of what you have been indulging in. Okay, have it your way. It's getting too late. The last but not least is it's getting too late to be recreating God into the image of man. What this world needs is not more a more uh, man like God. The world needs more God-like men. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? The world that we live in is not desperate for a God that looks more like man. The world that we live in is desperate for man to look more like God. It's getting too late to squeeze our theology to make it fit our experience. What does this have to do with anything? Understand this, that the twofold purpose of Advent, somebody say Advent, Advent. is that it is first intended uh, to prepare us for the celebration of the birth of Christ Jesus. That's its first intention. Advent is the first season in the church calendar. Everything else flows from this. And its first purpose is to prepare us for the celebration of the birth of Christ. But it has a second purpose. And its second purpose is to remind us that we are eagerly awaiting his return in glory. That not only are we preparing to celebrate the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, allowing us to behold the glory of the Father, but we are also being reminded that not only did he come then, but he's also coming again. We celebrate Advent as a sobering reminder that stuff that we have left hanging, we might need to pull it in order right about now. We celebrate Advent as a reminder that he's not coming for those who, who, who desired what was good. He's coming for those who did what was good. We celebrate Advent as a reminder that we cannot afford to live as though we will never stand before the judgment seat of Christ Jesus who will put up on the big screen every text message ever sent every uh, a website ever served every uh, e every conversation spoke, every eye roll Lord Jesus the eye rolls are going to take some time every come on somebody every mumble under our breath we celebrate Advent to remind us not just of the glory of Christmas but of the severity of his return. The Bible says every eye shall see him and every tongue shall confess him. Lord, have mercy. The Bible also says that his return will be in a moment and the twinkling of an eye. And when he comes, guess what? Everybody is not going. Not even all the people that you think are going are going. It's going to be in such a moment that I heard somebody say a surgeon will be working on an old lady doing a surgery, turn around and ask the, 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 the nurse for the scalpel, turn back around and the lady will be gone. Lord have mercy. So this season of Advent, this lighting of candles, this preparing our hearts is not just to celebrate the birth of Christ Jesus, but to remind us that it is getting too late for us 
to continue to participate in things that will rob us of his redemption. It's getting too late. And so as we prepare even to come to the communion table today, I want to say this. I want to ask God as we partake in this communion celebration, as we come to this table today, I'm asking that we would receive urgent grace to meet our urgent plea because it's getting too late. I hope, I hope, I hope I've been able to, I don't know if I did, communicate that it is not the issue of our desire that is problematic for God. It is the issue of our participation. What is it that I do with that desire? Do I repurpose God to meet my desire? Or do I repurpose my desire to accommodate God? And as we come to this communion today, table today with every eye closed, my prayer is that we would receive urgent grace to meet us at the point of our urgent plea. For some of us have been crying out, God, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He's waiting for the nevertheless. Not my will, but your will be done. Father,